Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much for having me here today. Um, I'm excited to talk to you all about the left heart, the right heart, the lungs, oh my, and how identifying the CDH phenotype can impact therapeutic management. Um, I have no financial disclosures. Um, this presentation will involve discussion of unapproved or off-label experimental or investigational use of medications. So our objectives today are to review the underlying hedonymics associated with CDH in acute setting, to describe the mechanisms of therapy that impact patients with CDH, and understand the use of echocardiography and management of the CDH population. So I, I really love the CDH population and thinking about the physiology here because it's really a microcosm of so many of our disease processes that we think about for a neonatal neonatal population. We're learning more and more about the role of the LV in many of our um, patients, um, for example, in our BPD population and in many other our populations, of the impact the LV actually has on pathophysiology. And so when we think about congenital diaphragmatic hernia, we're really trying to think about how does the CDH impact um, the overall physiology? How does it impact the right heart? How does it impact the lungs? How about the left heart? And how do all of them interact with each other to, um, to cause pathology? And how can we impact them by our management strategies? And so, you know, for CDH, we're trying to set that path to where these patients will actually do well. Um, and we've tried many things along the way. There's many therapies that we've tried. Some we've tried in it's not worked well, such as surfactant and general ventilation, which is what we're more utilizing these days. There's many that we've tried that seems to like it should work in a patient that has pulmonary hypertension, um, but it just doesn't. So INO, nitric oxide, does not really work in this population in all, in the, as an overall in this population, but perhaps there's a subgroup that it does. So even with all the therapies and all the, the improvements and enhancements we've done with CDH and understand the CDH physiology, we still have a fairly high mortality rate for congenital diaphragmatic hernia. Um, it has improved for the past 25 years. This is a nice recent study that came out from the CDH registry that looked over 5,000 patients with CDH over 25 years and found the overall mortality rate is decreasing over time, but still about 25%. Um, and that's where many studies show 25 to 30% for a mortality rate. Um, so we are getting somewhat better, but is there something about the therapies that we can buy for this population that we can actually enhance their outcomes? Um, so how can we think about these multitude of population, the, the different phenotypes um, and how they interact, and how can we actually use a cardiography to, to work through this physiology and understand which patients may need different um, medications and therapies? So as we all know with CDH, there's multiple physiologies that are undergoing here and multiple um, ways that the pathophysiology may occur. Whoops, um, sorry. Um, is it, okay, sorry, the screen just changed here. Um, so, um, for when you think about the pathophysiology, you think about dual hit hypothesis or bilateral lung hypoplasia during organogenesis, the ipsilateral lung compression by abdominal herniation. And um, then lung hypoplasia, there are many underlying pathophysiology that we think may be contributing. It's potentially compression for LV hypoplasia Maybe and compression of the intestines. not moving. Slides okay. is not there. Not um, my, so the slides had changed from what I, where I was before to a different mode. Do you know? I'm not sure what happened there. It's it is just the, the first slide. Um, I don't think I did anything differently. Um, it said that someone else took control of the slides. Is that uh, okay? Let me see if I can. Okay. How? Okay. Should we try that again? How about that now? Now can you see the slides? Better. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, so the LV hypoplasia contributors are compression, um, also decreased foramenal flow, so flow far follows form. So as the heart shifts in prenatal life and fetal life, that flow pattern can go less goes across the PFO into the left side that may impact growth. And also as the gestation goes on, there potentially is decreased pulmonary flow 
um, from patients with CDH, that may also affect the LV um, formation. In addition, there's abnormal pulmonary vascular development with a decreased pulmonary vascular bed and elevated ventricular pressures with hypertrophy that we'll see in many of these patients. So there is such an interaction with heart and lungs with our CDH population. As I can mention, it's really a microcosm for what we see um, in, um, in the different pathophysiology that we can see in our neonatal um, uh, patient population. So you can have maldevelopment of the pulmonary vasculature, which leads to elevated PVR and pulmonary artery pressure. You're going to have LV hypoplasia. And you think about if a patient has more RV dysfunction, then you think maybe vasodilators would help to help that RV afterload. But in CDH, you may have left ventricular hypoplasia. And if you give those kids increased, if you vasodilate those kids, you may actually worsen their pulmonary hypertension, those that have LV hypoplasia, when that pulmonary vasculature gets dilated and can't empty into a, a a uh, left ventricle or left side um, that is not as relaxed. And so there's three components that contribute to CDH pathophysiology that we consider. Um, there's pulmonary hypoplasia, um, which we know is a component, ventricular dysfunction, which we're learning more and more as a component of CDH and as a potential modifier for risk factors, and then pulmonary hypertension, which you know this population also has. And pH in our CDH population I mean, studies that have demonstrated is fairly high, 68 to 79%, and ventricular dysfunction we've seen anywhere from the 30s to 39% of ventricular dysfunction. And all of these interplays can actually lead to worsening pulmonary hypertension. This is a nice review out from um, John Kinsella in the group that demonstrates, that discusses from the different aspects of pulmonary hypoplasia when you can have decreased phasic lung stretch compression of the lungs, decreased surface area for gas exchange, and poor lung recruitment and lung injury from mechanical ventilation. That can lead to worsening pulmonary hypertension. Ventricular dysfunction, we can have pulmonary venous hypertension. If you give vasodilator therapy, you can have pulmonary edema, decreased cardiac output. These can all lead to worsening pulmonary hypertension. And when you have pulmonary hypertension itself from pulmonary vascular disease, where you have high tone abnormal reactivity, structural remodeling, reduced vessel growth, all three of these can combine to, to produce further pulmonary hypertension. And affecting one may worsen you and may make you better, but trying to understand the interplay is certainly important. So there's been many studies looking at components that could affect pulmonary hypertension because there's, we know this is really a component within, pulmonary, within CDH population. Um, many studies looking at nitric oxide, saying is nitric oxide helpful? Is it not necessary? What about meds like vasopressin? prostaglandin, what can we do to help this patient population? And how do we choose this best therapy? And really what we wanna to try to do is individualize treatment plan. So how do we receive, achieve precision in this population? Well, we wanna be able to consider intertwining the contributors to pathology. So looking at how do we affect pulmonary hypertension, pulmonary hypoplasia and ventricular dysfunction, looking at early initial echo to assess cardiac function and pulmonary pressures and to do subsequent echoes based on targeted individual treatment, based on what you see for echo and clinical findings. Um, so how do we do that? Well, let's first talk a little bit and take a step back and think about RV and LV function and how different this is. Remember, this is how we think about interaction, how CDH works. So the normal morphology is to wrap crescentically the RV around the LV. And as you dilate out, you will dilate hypertrophy, dilate that RV, but you'll also impact your LV and have ventricular ventricular actions. That in the CDH population, when you already have LV hypoplasia, can also impact LV relaxation when you have a big dilated RV. And an important thing to consider, especially when you think about our measures for function, is that longitudinal motion is really the major contributor to RV contraction. And that is different from the LV side. And what's the pathophysiology of acute pulmonary hypertension? This other than kind of outlines when you have an acute pulmonary hypertensive crisis, you have um, an increased RV and diastolic pressure, um, an end diastolic volume that can lead to a septal shift, RV ischemia and failure. And that in isolation, certainly want to give some afterload reduction. But again, a patient who has LV dysfunction, this may be detrimental to them. And so when we're thinking about how can we assess these patients, well, this is where echo comes in very beneficial. You think about increasing RV afterload, you can look at such factors such as as your RV increases, as your RV afterload increases, your RV starts to dilate. You go from a rounded septum, it starts to flatten, you have a dilating RV, becomes more hypertrophied and dilated with a flattened or D-shaped septum that even can bow into the RV. 
and that's with increasing afterload. And so we can see that by ACO and we can look at some of those measures. Now LV function is different. Right? LV function is really a twisting type motion. And where it becomes really interesting when you think about LV function in the CDH population is you have twisting of the heart um, that contributes to wall thickening, injection of much of the blood volume in systole. But what's really interesting when you think about the LV function is really thinking about the untwisting and diastole. And in the normal newborn, um, all normal newborns have a um, abnormal diastolic function. So all of them take some time to relax and some time for that LV um, and diastolic pressure to go down, that LV to be able to untwist and relax appropriately. Um, and we can we, we understand that's the case and in CDH populations, these may be exaggerated by LV patients with LV hypoplasia and how we assess it and how we can identify that can be important in the CDH population. And so I, I talk about diastolic because I think it's an important concept to really try to understand. Um, and when you think about di left ventricular diastole, you're thinking about iso when the stages of diastole. You have isovolumic relaxation, the semilunar valve closes prior to the opening of that AV valve. Um, once the ventricular pressure goes below the atrial pressure, you have un your untwisting is occurring and you have that valve opens and you have rapid filling, supposedly rapid filling if you have a patient um, who has a, a really receptive left ventricle, and that's your e-velocity on an echo. Then you'll have diastasis where you have atrial and ventricular pressures equalize, and then atrial contraction where you have a late diastole, um, atrial pressure increases, and you have that second wave of flow across the AV valve. So you start this physiology of isovolumic relaxation, the auric valve closes, your mitral valve opens, and you have a rapid inflow as you untwist, and you have that atrial kick, and you have um, atrial contraction, you have further flow that comes in. And what's interesting in our neonates, you'll, when you look by echo, you can see a reversal of that, what, is, what we think is normal. So that E wave, that initial flow coming in um, is um, lower because of the diastolic dysfunction and the atrial kick can actually be higher. So we know to expect that in a patient population. So if a patient has has a smaller LV, then you think that may be exaggerated and how can we affect that? So why obtain an echo and why obtain an early in our population? Well, for CDH, for many reasons. So you want to obtain your initial echo to look at, um, to look at CDH or pH assessment, ventricular size and function. And we're going to spend a lot of time today or a lot of discussion on shunt assessment. Um, because shunt assessment may give us a bit of an idea of what's going on um, intrinsically with these, with these patients, give us an idea of the physio underlying physiology. And you really want to consider early and frequent assessment of cardiac function and pH titrate management. These patients can change within hours. And I've certainly been at bedside for patients where their physiology, during the newborn period, as PVR drops and um, function changes over a much shorter period of time, it, it is not unreasonably doing multiple echoes in short periods of time to see how your physiology is changing and how you need to adjust your management. And so pH assessment by echocardiography, we have more traditional measures that we think about um, that many of the pH guidelines will consider looking at TR estimate, septal geometry, RV size and function. Um, and these are reasonable measures to look at. Many studies looking at uh, pulmonary hypertension will look at these, but there are additional um, criteria. Um, and actually there is a, a recent paper um, by Florian Kim Mueller where he looked at an interesting study, looked at 87 CDH neonates and um, would really look to assess different echo parameters and found that um, pulmonary artery acceleration time um, was significantly lower in the ECMO patients compared to the non-ECMO patients um, and in the survivors and overall. And so there may be more measures that we're able to use that can give us better assessment of our patient population. One for should we try to identify patients that may benefit um, from early, um, early uh, additional management um, to impact outcomes, or are there more subtleties that we can see um, that may identify left ventricular dysfunction and may, may allow us to provide different therapies? So I'm going to focus in here um, on the different phenotypes and trying to understand the different phenotypes within CDH. And I'm going to outline three phenotypes. Um, and when you think about this, these phenotypes we'll see early on, and I'm really focusing on the first couple days for this patient population. I'll talk more about why I'm only focusing on the first couple days. And so at birth, you know, you have this placenta goes, you have an increase in SVR, low loss of low um, resistance placental flow, a decrease in pulmonary vascular resistance, you have aeration of the lung, the lung the CDH patients have. Um, and 
you'll have patients that may have increasing pulmonary hypertension and a worsening LV compliance, and we may be able to parse these patients out. I'm using clinical and echo findings to be able to identify different um, algorithms that they should go on to try to enhance their management. So we're going to talk about three different phenotypes. We'll talk about phenotype one, which is when patients that may have no or mild pH and no cardiac dysfunction. Phenotype two, will they have pulmonary hypertension without cardiac dysfunction or looking at RV dysfunction, really thinking about the precapillary pH phenotype. And phenotype three, um, or the primary LV dysfunction and, and pulmonary hypertension for a post-capillary pH phenotype. And when I talk about these, I'm going to be really talking about them in extremes. So there's going to be patients really that follow along in a mix of these, um, but we'll talk about to understand the concept of physiology. And with phenotype one, we're thinking about patients who really don't have much pH. When, they're, when you're looking at their um, cardiac function, their shunts, you're, we're thinking about it as if you have a patient that has no or mild pH, has no cardiac dysfunction, then you would expect to have a left-right um, PDA if there's a PDA present, and certainly within the few hours after birth and, and lower normal pH, um, this should be coming down and, and towards left-to-right flow. The atrial shunt pattern, remember that's not from pulmonary vascular resistance, it's really more related to LV compliance or related to relationship and compliance. So you're thinking about relationship of, L, of um, right to left compliance, right ventricle, left ventricle. And the right ventricle over time should have decreased, um, co uh, increased compliance compared to your left ventricle. So you should have a left to right atrial shunt in these patients. Now, as you move to phenotype two, where you have pulmonary hypertension with no cardiac dysfunction or primary RV dysfunction, these may be patients that perhaps have increased RV afterloads, may have more pulmonary hypertension phenotype. Um, and so they may have a right to left PDA um, if they have significant pulmonary hypertension and then potentially a right to left or bidirectional atrial level shunt where the RV compliance is poor in relation to the LV compliance. So you'll see the shunting pattern different. Now in phenotype three, where you have pulmonary hypertension and primary, primary LV dysfunction or a post capillary phenotype, you have a patient who may have a left to right atrial level shunt um, but they have a right to left PDA. So let me let me re turn that around here. So if you have a patient that has significant pulmonary hypertension and you have a right to left PDA, you would expect that shunt, the RV compliance to be poor, and you would expect that shunt to be right to left or bidirectional. If you have a left to right atrial shunt, that may tell you, well, is it because your LV compliance then is worse in relation to the RV, and do you have LV dysfunction such that you can't relax your LV, translates back to higher pressures in your LA, and thus you have left to right atrial level shunts. And so that's what we're considering and trying to look at. And so first we'll talk about phenotype one. So in this patient population where they have no or mild pH and a normal biventricular function, I mentioned you see left to right atrial level shunts, um, and a left to right PDA. So on the right, we have top left is parasitic long axis view, um, where you have the RV, which is on top, um, looks relatively okay with size, function looks okay. On the bottom left is what we typically think about for looking at septal geometry, that RV is um, very compliant over the LV. And then in the um, right hand bottom, you see left to right atrial level shunt in there as well. So considering these patients, with CDH that they may have more of the pulmonary hypoplasia phenotype. So for these patients, our, our, our ventilation strategies of general ventilation where you have low PEEP, moderate PIP, high rate, um, low eye times, trying to, to impact lung protection. And where this is really important is when um, you think about how important it is to optimize lung recruitment to enhance management and address um, PVR. And remember the U-shaped relationship between lung volume and pulmonary vascular resistance. So, and this is for all the phenotypes that we're thinking about here, we're thinking about PEEP and how you affect the from a heart-lung interaction. So it's not just thinking about the heart, it's not just thinking about the lung, it's all of it combined. So if you have a patient um, that has too high PEEP, and has high afterload, that RV, which is um, very compliant, may not respond well to that higher PEEP and that RV afterload. So you may have decreased venous return, decreased RV output. Um, and so you want to try to recruit the lung for adequate PEEP, but again, over distension is not 
right either you over distend you can actually get more pvr as well so it is a little bit of a goal lock to try to figure out where you're going to get your best frc so that your pulmonary vascular resistance is the lowest um and that's thinking about giving lower peeps for our population which there are studies looking at even two to five for peeps um, to try to affect your um, your um, preload, uh, your afterload into your RV. So try and affect for that phenotype one. Now for phenotype two, where you have pulmonary hypertension but no cardiac dysfunction or primary RV dysfunction, what can we do for these populations? So these are populations in phenotype two where you may see patients that have a right to left PDA, I see on the bottom left, have an atrial septum that is right to left or bidirectional, um, and have a septal flattening. Now, in this patient population, we would think that this would potentially be a patient population that nitric would be helpful for. Um, in this patient population as well, you, can, you may have patients that have RV dysfunction, um, and whether we see that or not, when there's a PDA present, that may be the indication for opening your PDA up again. Um, but this is another type within the phenotype two that we think about for a pre-capillary phenotype. And so for these patient population, um, then you think about conventional ventilation to affect that, um, vasodilators for PG, particularly in PG, when you're thinking about patients that have severe pulmonary hypertension or RV dysfunction um, in the setting of a closing or closed duct, and then systolic and diastolic RV support with potentially milrinone as an option to use for this patient population. And we'll get more into milrinone later. So I know for pH and CDH sounds like an obvious choice. Um, with CDH pulmonary hypertension histology, we've seen that there's hypoplasia pruning of the pulmonary vascular bed, pulmonary vascular remodeling, and in 1992, uh, INO was, was the molecule of the year. And it seems very obvious you have, you have pulmonary hypertension um, in so many of our other neonates with, with neonatal pathophysiology, uh, nitric works great for pulmonary hypertension. But this, you know, one of these earlier, the early study was um, the NINO study in 1997 that came out. It was a randomized double mass controlled multicenter study determined whether nitric oxide um, in term and near term infants with CDH would reduce the occurrence of death and or the initiation of ECMO. And unfortunately, they didn't find that, that was, there was um, an improvement um, for it. Um, it did not improve the need for ECMO or death, and it was actually uh, terminated early. And so regardless of that, though, there is still quite a bit of use of INO in our CDH population and other studies that have demonstrated that when you give INO to an overall population of CDH patients, there doesn't seem to be an overall benefit. It may actually harm. And so this was a, a study out from the CDH registry that included um, over 3,000 patients with CDH and really saw that INO use is very widespread. Um, and what's so interesting about this, when you look at these 3,000 patients with CDH, majority of them had echoes that were able to be looked at. And 2,000 of them, a little over 2,000, had pulmonary hypertension. 900 or so did not have pulmonary hypertension. And when you look at how many of them received INO, it's pretty variable within there. Um, and it's frequently, it was unrelated to whether the patient had pulmonary hypertension or not. And the use of inhaled nitric oxide may be associated with increased mortality. And this is what they found in, in this study. And it's amazing to, th to think about giving a medication when we may have the tools to be able to identify this patient population better. So we did a study um, actually led by Carolyn No, who um, out of the, the um, CDH study group, um, that was a the multicenter cohort study. We looked at the impact of early INO use in the first 72 hours. And we increased, um, had increased mortality in ECMO with use of INO, even when adjusting for echo characteristics, which we did try to look at shunts, neonatal characteristics and defect size and size and repair, side and size and repair. And we really did not see that early INO was associated with improved outcomes. Um, now, you can ask and begs to ask the question of whether we can get precise enough with this, um, with a, a registry study to be able to really identify these individual, the individuality of these patients. But it just, it again, says that I, Putting INO in these kids is not necessarily a slam dunk, even with some of the the trying to look at some of the echo parameters um, that we look at without potentially seeing the rest of the whole, the whole picture. And so these led to to these studies and these considerations with um, with INO and CDH led to guidelines that include out of the PPH um, uh, the the PH guidelines, American Heart Society, Association, American Thoracic Society. 
that INU used should be should be used cautiously in patients. Um, it can be used, but used cautiously with suspected LV dysfunction. And so really we want to think about that. And this nice meta um, um, Cochrane review looking at INO for respiratory failure in infants born at term at or near term, um, they concluded that it's effective except in patients who do not have a diaphragmatic hernia based on the studies they looked at. And so we do have to have some caution about this. Um, and that's where some of the other studies are coming into place. The, the no-no study um, um, out with Matt Harding um, in Texas is really trying to do a, a multi-center de-implementation study to see, can we see the impact um, of de-escalating the use of nitric um, on the patient population with CDH. And so really when you think about why isn't it working well, because of things we talked about, it's not just pulmonary hypertension. Um, ventricular performance is associated with the need for um, um, ECMO in the study that Gabriel Altit um, uh, looked at here in 2017. We found that decreased left and right ventricular performance by conventional and um, um, advanced measures, including um, TAPSI and fractional area change, as well as strain imaging, were significantly associated with the need for ECMO in the setting of similar degrees of pH. So it wasn't just the pulmonary hypertension that put these patients on ECMO, it was also um, the, the ventricular performance. And this, this is in agreement with a um, CH registry study out of, by Neil Patel that looked at um, over a thousand patients with echoes in the first 48 hours, and they found increased mortality in patients with ventricular dysfunction. And when you look at that, those patients that had a component of LV dysfunction, so isolated LV dysfunction, they found about 5%. Remember, these are registry results, so this is not necessarily just diastolic, um, including diastolic dysfunction, so perhaps we're not quite getting all the population here. Um, but it, it's it's a very nice data to show us that LV dysfunction seems to be, having this component of LV dysfunction, even on, on the, these registry studies, that it impacts outcomes. And, and why is that? Well, it may outline that there are subgroups that may have improvement with CDH. So this is a study out from the CHOP group um, that looked at nitric oxide in a subset of patients with pH and normal systolic um, function. And they found that ECMO requirement um, was increased in those systolic dysfunction um, um, as opposed to those preserved systolic function. And there was increased death in this population that were treated with um, nitric. And so that leads us to this post-capillary pH phenotype. So those patients with primary LV dysfunction um, and trying to understand how can we affect this patient population um, um, such that um, we can um, affect outcomes. And so in a patient that has pulmonary hypertension, LV dysfunction, um, in this phenotype three, they may have a left to right PDA. Uh, let me see this here. Um, a left to right PDA um, and, I'm sorry, right to left PDA and a left to right atrial level shunt. And so in this patient population, um, the LV dysfunction, so if you have an inability to relax your LV well, it can lead to left atrial hypertension, that's a left to right atrial level shunt, uh, pulmonary venous hypertension, and giving vasodilator therapy can potentially lead to, force cl to clinical worsening. And milrinone may play a role in these patients' LV dysfunction as well. PGE may also be useful. They may be necessary for systemic circulation to put these patients on P PGE. Um, but the big take home from this is that vasodilation may actually worsen these patients. And what's really important, I think, to think about is, as I mentioned, the, the LV dysfunction and diastolic dysfunction in the neonates that we know is a normal um, transitional LV that also does have some transition, seems to have some transition within the neonate, the neonatal CDH population as well. And so um, this publication out from Neil Patel and Florian Kipfeiler looked at improvement in LV function by data three to four compared to day one and two, um, indicating that there was fa fairly rapid improvement in LV within the first couple of days. So in assessing these patients, doing an echo in the first day of life and waiting for a week may not be enough to be able to really assess that if the LV is a problem initially, and if you don't want to give uh, give nitric oxide initially because it's LV dysfunction, within a few days that LV may um, relax and it may it may move from a post capillary phenotype to potentially a pre capillary phenotype, and further assessment may be important to consider in this population.
And so there is a sub -pop this population that may worsen um, with nitric oxide and seem to be the patients with LV systolic dysfunction and INO use had increased use of ECMO and increased mortality um, in that CHOP study. And so with precision medicine here, we're really trying to consider intertwining the contributors of pathology um, and using early initial echocardiography to assess cardiac function and pulmonary pressures. Um, and thinking about target individualized treatment based on clinical and echocardiographic findings. Um, so what about the early use of cardiovascular support? So we've thought about and we've certainly used milrinone um, as um, a PD3 um, inhibitor allowing for increased cyclic AMP and allow for, for relaxation of the vasculature. And we've been able to, we've utilized that um, um, in the uh, in our pH population to see decreases in our pulmonary pressures, um, as well as um, it does have may have some decrease in our systemic vascular resistance, um, but patients seem to tolerate this well. When this was done as kind of a pilot to look and do how do patients tolerate milrinone in our neonatal population? They don't seem to have it so much of a um, hypotension, um, but milrinone it, it's a consideration that milrinone may help for. Um, those with LV dysfunction. And so there's an ongoing study um, led by um, Satyan that's really looking at how does milrinone affect our CDH population with a primary outcome as oxygenation response determined by a change in oxygenation index at 24 hours after initiation of the study drug. So we'll be eagerly looking to see what those results are um, for that study. And milrinone um, may be useful. So there was a study that um, did also looking at the response to nitric oxide in combination with milrinone. That may be that combination. Um, and this may be also be patients that are a little bit later and not necessarily in that acute first couple of days when LV dysfunction may be more of an um, may be more of a consideration. Um, but that the response to nitric oxide in combination with milrinone may be associated with improved oxygenation and better survival after C after ECMO in the infants with CDH. Again, thinking about that later population. Vasopressin is another interesting medication that has um, taken some, um, that has more and more interest in the CDH population. We're actually using it more in our preemies and our neonates um, um, for afterload. So it acts as a stomach vasoconstrictor, but notably their activation of receptors on the endothelial cells in the pulmonary vasculature um, can cause the release of an NO leading to pulmonary vasodilation. So there seems to be a, potentially a role of va pulmonary vasodilation with using vasopressin. Um, and for our patients that have um, some hypotension, vasopressin may be a reasonable medication to use. There is a consideration that um, there is a consideration that in patients that have LV dysfunction, giving the medication that has that would increase afterload. Um, may be ill-advised. However, even in the study, there were some patients um, that had LV dysfunction and still benefited from, from vasopressin. So whether there's a component of the pulmonary vasodilation that actually helps um, and maybe the increase in afterload is not as um, pronounced um, with that vasodilatory capacity in place is something to consider. But this has been an interesting medication to use and potentially, uh, and there are places that are using epi and vasopressin as a combination of use that, we use that some here as well. Um, um, as a therapy to, to potentially impact outcomes, trying to really think about, cautious about which medications we're using. And I say that because, you know, dopamine, and, and there's been a lot of discussion and considerations on um, use of dopamine in the population, and that um, dopamine acts as a nonspecific vasoconstrictor. And I really love about this study is um, Seth had done this study um, in animal models and found that when you gave um, dopamine, in control patients, um, they had an increased um, systemic pressure, so that's significant increase in pulmonary artery pressures. But when you had patients, um, uh, lambs that had PPHN, um, the remodeled pulmonary arteries seemed more sensitive. So there was an increase when dopamine was given, an increase in systemic and pulmonary artery um, pressures when um, dopamine was given to this to this animal um, animal model. So. It, when I had mentioned that, you know, when you're thinking about studies and how, when you're doing registry studies and trying to get a, a, the assessment, uh, assessment of um, echoes and, and compilation, um, it, having the nuances of, well, was it was a patient on dopamine, and is it feasible that the patient's on dopamine? Is there um, pulmonary hypertension um, um, worsening? Is there a different responsiveness? 
Um, and those considerations when you're thinking about what medications to add on to this pa patient population, perhaps we should avoid using too much dopamine in the patient population and such a CDH where there is a lot of pulmonary hypertension that's involved and we should think about other medications. Um, so understanding the, the phenotype um, can certainly help to elucidate the most appropriate management options. Um, so understanding the shunt physiology, um, both the atrial and ductal shunt can provide valuable, valuable information in this patient. Um, and so when you're thinking about how to do, to, to do precision medicine in our population, you getting an early echo um, to assess not only for CDH, but how does um, the function look? How does the pulmonary hypertension look? If there is no pH or normal function, that takes you in one direction. And do we need to ad identify more of the um, respiratory symptomatology in this population? For those patients that have moderate or severe pulmonary hypertension, what is their underlying dysfunction? How does that change over time? Um, and how do you affect that over time? So thinking about patients with mild pH and normal biventricular function, really considering your um, pulmonary vascular or your um, respiratory component for RV afterload considerations, elevated PVR, trying to stay on that um, optimal FRC to have the lowest PVR that you can. Um, and hopefully with affecting that, we can get these patients towards management and treatment. Um, with moderate or severe pulmonary hypertension RV dysfunction, early and repeated echocardiography is, uh, is really advised here. And in those patients that have normal function, um, considering with moderate or severe pH, should we be adding on mild this population or INO um, to try to in, in, improve and enhance their pulmonary hypertension in the setting where they start to develop RV dysfunction, thinking about vasodilators, now wanting to know if there's LV dysfunction as well when you're thinking about INO and really we need more studies and more understanding of this population to know in what situations, if, if, if able, we can utilize INO. Hopefully some of the upcoming studies will help us to delineate this more. Um, in those patients with pulmonary hypertension and, and um, an RV dysfunction. Um, thinking about the ductus, if the ductus closes off, then your RV has no outlet um, or doesn't have much of an outlet, so can hypertrophy and go into failure. So um, putting on PGE can be helpful in this population as well. Um, and there are considerations with PGE and um, putting on PGE in this population and when to potentially think about discontinuing PGE, and this has come up um, in our ECMO population as well on when to discontinue PGE on the ECMO population and um, whether it's when you have more left or right shunts and your pH is somewhat better so you're not impacting the uh, pulmonary vascular further by having increased shunts is a consideration as population. So again, that points to further discussion, further considerations for echoes um, that you can obtain. Um, milrinone um, is a consideration, epi and vasopressin, really trying to avoid um, dopamine in this population um, is feasible, if feasible. And I remember with epi, as you go up on higher doses, you can potentially impact the pulmonary vasculature. Um, so trying to keep lower doses for that um, is advisable if able. And then there is still a potential for ECMO. As much as we try to avoid putting ECMO on this patient population with significant RV dysfunction, there's potential there. but. Um, if it is a pre-capillary phenotype, can we affect enough of the RV afterload and affect the RV function that we can avoid ECMO? Now, in those patients with pH and LV dysfunction, when you're thinking about early and repeated echocardiography, um, with moderate or severe pH um, and developing um, LV dysfunction or, or presence of LV dysfunction, this is more in the first couple of days in particular, um, supporting the systolic and diastolic LV is going to be key. So milrinone may be a, con a consideration um, dobutamine and epi one as well. And in some patients, um, having the ductus um, open um, and for systemic flow. And in some patients, we've seen patients that have had um, retrograde flow in the arch with a huge ductus and retrograde flow in the arch and the concern that the arch may be small um, and whether keeping those patients on PGE to enhance cardiac output is beneficial or is it possible that putting those kids on PGE doesn't allow as much flow um, um, to go over to the to the um, back to the pulmonary vasculature, um, it's something to consider. Um, avoiding INO in this population, although it doesn't mean that this doesn't change over time, um, and then considering ECMO as well. Um,
I see the question in there. I'll answer that question. Um, so for precision medicine uh, for CDH, consider intertwine the contributors, um, as I had mentioned in here, um, and with further interventions on this. I, and I think we're learning more about this. And I, I saw Dr. Yur's question about um, if there's evidence that this has changed outcomes, and I'd love to talk further about that. Uh, but I think we do, do need more information assessment. And, and a consideration that always comes up, and I'm well, I mean, I get cautious about this as well, is how long it could potentially can take to do an echo and whether these kids can decompensate when you're doing the echo and end up on ECMO. And I think that is a really um, a really interesting question. Um, and I don't think that, um, I think there are ways to potentially put a protocol together where you have shortened echoes. So you're looking for only certain pathology um, and certain shunt patterns, for example, and function assessment that you don't have to do a full and complete echo that may take longer or have a more um, a more targeted group of people that are doing echo, such as those with who have TNE experience. Um, so I think there the questions do certainly come up, and I've been asked about the patients that are unstable to get these echoes and what we do about that. But I think there are ways to be able to make protocolized um, um, uh, to make protocols to be able to get more limited information um, for these initial echoes when you're trying to delineate what is the best option, especially in those first 48 to 72 hours. Um, so. I, I know we have a bit of time for questions here, and I saw there are some questions in the chat. 